Uh, I have to say, just on a, on a personal note, um, if I think back sort of 10 years ago when I thought, hey, this might be a neat thing for my students to use, the fact that there is a, like a room full of people talking about this is, is mind-blowing to me, really. So uh, thank you for coming along. Thank you, Gareth, for helping to organise this. Um, 15 minutes is not long, so I think what I wanted to do uh, was talk just very briefly about the development of PLIs, but primarily look at some of the educational research that has been done. And I've identified three areas that were interesting to me because they actually reflect my own initial concerns about you know, how might this really work in practice. And for each of those areas, I've picked one or two papers that I'm just going to very, very quickly share with you the findings. Um, so my background is very much like Charles. I, it really spoke to me when you said there's just one of me, right? Um, so the, the sort of courses I was teaching at the University of Auckland, this is going back about 10 years now, were these huge first-year courses. Um, in fact, the largest course that I was teaching had about 1,000 students. So you know, two streams of 500 students. There really was just one of me. And I felt that you know, there was only so much that I could do to, to contribute to each individ individual student's learning. And so I was really interested in exploring ways that I could have students work together, right? some sort of peer learning activities. I played around with peer review. I played around with like, having a class wiki where students would showcase the kind of things they were working on. Um, but it was actually the feedback that I got on my teaching evaluations. You guys must do teaching evaluations, right? Um, so back then they were done on paper. So we distributed bits of paper, students would write these comments. And we had this amazing system at Auckland where someone else would read all the comments for us and tabulate what were the most pressing issues. So we got the kind of this report. This, this was the most uh, important issue as far as the students were concerned. And the thing that all my students would say is we want more practice questions. And that's a theme that I've heard coming up today as well. And I think one of the reasons for this was that we had very high stakes final exams. So regardless of how well students had done throughout the semester, they had to pass those final exams. And they were really desperate for more practice questions. They really wanted opportunities to test themselves. Um, and we know that when students um, go through this, this practice testing, that's a really powerful way for them to reinforce what they know, as long as they get corrective feedback. So as long as they know Okay, I've made a mistake here, and they've got some way of correcting that. The challenge, of course, was how to produce all these practice questions. And I thought I might throw in a, a trivia question here for you guys, which is, do you know, in January 2007, who was Time's Person of the Year? Little known fact, it was actually Gareth. <laughs> Did you know that? It wasn't just Gareth, though. It was, it was everybody in the world. This was, this was when this whole buzzword of user-generated content was really massive. I think like YouTube might have just sold to Google. Um, and you know, our students were very enthusiastic users of these systems like Wikipedia and YouTube, and so they understood the value of this model. Right? As long as you have enough individual users each making a small contribution to some resource, then that resource can become really valuable. And so I thought it might be interesting just to apply this model to this problem of could we create lots of practice questions. And it really was just something I wanted to give my students to, to play around with. I really had no expectations that it, it might work that well. In fact, I had some real concerns about how it would work. These were my three primary concerns. The first one was around quality. Right? Could my students actually create questions that were of a high enough quality that they would be useful and could be used for practice purposes? The second one was around motivation. Um, I, I really love, Charles, your uh, very complicated rubric for grading their, kind of, um, their activity. You know, and I was curious as well, how could I motivate students to engage, not just to use it, but to engage in ways that would be useful to their learning? Right? There are certain things that we know, such as, for example, um, in fact, your charts also were lovely. There's huge peaks, right? Instead of students doing all of their practice testing in one session, ideally we'd like them to come back and do that practice testing over a period of time. Space repetition is what it's called. Um, and the third thing was really around learning, right? Would there be any evidence that students would actually learn anything by engaging this act in this activity? So these were kind of my three questions, and it turns out these are the, the three areas that a lot of the research um, that I've seen has been based around. Um, and so what's happened over time is more and more people have, have used this tool, and again, as I said, I really never expected anyone outside of my um, own students to ever use it. But now there's been something like 2,000 institutions, and it's been used in courses across such a wide range of subjects, which means that some of the research findings are kind of generalizable. Right? So it's not just this works in the subject, but, but you know, here's what we see when it's used across a range of subjects. Um, 
And at the very end of last year, I, I was absolutely blown away to get this Reimagine Education Award. It was, it was a real huge surprise. Um, but that, that was um, uh, one of the, the sort of very rare but very nice ways of, of receiving some recognition uh, that actually this, this tool is, there is evidence that this tool does work because this award was very much looking uh, at, at providing evidence that this system actually is useful. Um, and so this table I actually produced for this talk because I didn't, I didn't have this, uh, this table. Now, if you look carefully, you can probably just make out the names here. I'm sort of testing the resolution of the, the projector. But these are all of the papers that have been published using data that's come out of the Pearwise tool. And one thing I'm really passionate about, if I can, as much as possible, helping researchers to conduct the types of studies they want to conduct. Um, you know, there is, as, as people have mentioned today, through the, the standard interface, you can access some of the data. If ever there is something you want or you want to try and tweak things slightly, um, I'm always happy to, to try and help uh, as much as I can with that. Um, so here's a bunch of uh, papers, and you can see I've, I've actually classified them against these three concerns that I had around quality. So a lot of the papers, all the ones marked red here, were really looking at evaluating the quality of the questions that were published by students on peerwise. Um, the blue, which is actually really the most common, is, is partly motivation, but actually it's a lot of just looking at perceptions. You know, what do students think about this? Do students think this is useful to them? Uh, and then a whole lot of stuff around learning. You know, is there evidence that this actually helps students? Now, some of these papers on learning are just looking at very straightforward correlations. You know, do students use it more, perform better? Um, but some of them are more sophisticated than that, and I'll talk about one of those uh, at the end. Okay, so here are the three uh, sort of big areas that I wanted to, to target, quality, motivation, and learning. And I've just picked, as I said, one or two papers from each of these areas that I'll share with you. Um, but if you are interested in looking at some of the other ones, the, this URL will show you um, where you can access all those existing papers. Um, very quickly, I love the examples that some of you had shown. So I'm showing one example. There's just one question example uh, in my slides here, and it's, of course, hard to pick one representative question out of four million questions, but here's a random one. This comes from a civil engineering course. Um, the first thing a student has to do, of course, in creating a question is they have to reflect back on what it is they're actually doing, you know, identifying what the important concepts are. Of course, in this case, it's something to do with uh, deflecting the shape of beams when you apply force. I'm not a civil engineer, so I have no idea how this question works. Um, the second thing is that a student has to come up with a set of answer options. So this is where they think about you know, what, what misunderstandings might my classmates have about this question? And of course, they indicate which one was correct. So if you were curious, C is the way that the shape would deflect. Um, and then they come up with an explanation. And this always, in my mind, was the most important part of authoring a question, where a student explains in their own words how they understand uh, the ideas. Okay, so um, there are several ways you can look at question quality. Um, one very simple way, but it's kind of fun, is to look at student perceptions of quality. And um, whenever a student answers a question, they have an opportunity to rate that question on this six-point scale. So a very simple thing to do is for every question to compute the average quality rating of that question based on these student assigned ratings. And if you have a look at all of the questions, now this is actually only about half of the questions in the repository, um, those that have enough ratings that it's meaningful to compute an average, you get this very normal distribution of ratings. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this because these are just student perceptions of quality, but a couple of things stand out. Number one, uh, the midpoint is right here, and about three quarters of the questions lie to the right of that midpoint. So most questions are at least perceived by students to be kind of better than that midpoint. Um, there are many more questions, many more uh, questions that are deemed to be good than, or good or, or better than are deemed to be fair or worse. Right? So there is this slight shift towards the right. Um, what's perhaps more interesting is expert assessments of quality. And we've already heard lots about Bloom's taxonomy. But a very standard way that these studies are conducted is for a group of experts to look at all of the questions created by, a student, uh, by students in a particular course and to classify those questions according to some criteria. These appear to be quite common criteria in literature. I've just picked three studies, one from computer science, one from chemistry, one from physics. Uh, in fact, Judy was talking about uh, it being hard to classify computer science questions according to Bloom's taxonomy, and sure enough, they didn't in this study either. Um, but what you can see, if you look at the... Oh, and by the way, if you look at Bloom's taxonomy, 
Um, the papers are generally just saying, is this question understand or higher? So basically, is it, is it not a recall question, but at least, at least at the understand level or higher? And if you look at the numbers, they're actually reasonably good, right? So in the 80s and 90s, 90%. So in other words, that's the proportion of questions in that repository that satisfy that criteria. Um, a couple of papers also reported which uh, or what proportion of questions satisfied all of the criteria, and it's around about three quarters. So certainly there are some questions that are not well designed in the, in the eyes of experts, but the majority of questions meet these criteria. Um, and I just wanted to play a very short video. This is the lead author of one of those studies. This is the lead author of the physics study. His name is Simon Bates. And here he's just talking about uh, some of the really great questions that he saw in his, in his physics course. I hope you can hear this. So, you know, we found pretty good evidence of students producing very high quality questions. Some of these were astonishing. They really were. They were so good that, again, the exper experimenter in me had an idea. And I reformatted some of these questions and I tidied them up for language, but I kept the essence of the questions the same. And I just happened to leave some of them on the tables in the coffee room uh, in our department and said, some of these are written by students. Can you work out which ones? And, um, well, first of all, they were all written by students. Uh, but then we put some in that were past exam papers, and the bottom line was a you know, non-representative sample of about 10 of my colleagues. They couldn't tell which was which. Students were producing questions that were essentially indistinguishable from uh, what people had produced in, in support of summative assessments. Idea for how to set exams in the future. And so they were using some of the very best student questions on their exams, and of course that's a really great way to motivate students because a lot of students would love to see their question appearing on a, on a final exam. Um, you know, I, I contacted Simon and asked him if he could send me some of the examples from his physics course, and these were some of those. <laughs> and what I love about these, I mean, so he assures me that all of the physics concepts are correct. But just the effort that students have gone into to create these really interesting backstories, right? I mean, you look in a physics book and the question is, you know, a mass M has dropped from a height H. But this is a, a stunt cat jumping out of a tree. By the way, how cool is that tree? That is a speech bubble that's green, right? Jumping onto a trampoline and, you know, King Kong and Godzilla having a battle. It was really just amazing to see that. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is, is motivation. I'll, I'll move through this very quickly. Uh, I was interested in, you know, could we uh, encourage students to engage in useful behaviours? Um, here is a, a super quick video I want to show you. This lady is discovering whether or not she has won a cash prize. I've turned the volume down on this one. <laughs> it turns out she did win a prize. Now, she's actually playing a game here called HQ which is, some of you may have heard of this, it's literally a game where you're answering multiple choice questions on your phone. But it's, it's a, an incredibly engaging game. Uh, it has uh, elements of time pressure, elements of um, competition, and as you can see, it elicits these powerful emotional responses. Um, I was interested in, now, we, you're never going to get students reacting like that <laughs> to any kind of actual course activity. But, but a, lot of, um, a lot of designers of other applications look to the game world to try and understand, can we use these elements from games and get some type of uh, increased engagement from our own users? So TripAdvisor is a great example of this. You can earn points when you're on TripAdvisor. So for example, the way TripAdvisor works is they want users to write reviews of the hotels they stayed in. So you can earn 100 points if you write a review. You can earn 30 points if you upload a photo. Um, and so you can see what, what TripAdvisor values. Now... If you do this and you start earning some points, the question becomes, well, what do I get for these points? You know, how can I redeem these for discounts of hotel stays? And you can find out on the TripAdvisor website, these points do not have monetary value and cannot be redeemed for anything. <laughs> so they literally tell you right there on the website that these things that we're giving you are completely worthless. And yet they're there because they work, because they do drive engagement of some users. Now, PYs incorporates... Uh, a, a range of game elements, a point system, a badge system. I could go into much more detail if interested later. Um, but we were interested in measuring the effect that these game elements have on user en or student engagement. Um, the standard way of doing this is to run an A-B test where you have a control group who have access to all of the learning content. They just can't earn the points or the badges. And you can compare their performance against students who have access to these game elements. And these are two randomly chosen groups. 
Um, students would say things like, I didn't think I was a badge type person, but I did enjoy getting them. It helped motivate me to do extra, and in doing so, I believe I've learned more effectively, and the data actually agrees with us. So what we found, just top level spoilers, is that this was a course where it was voluntary to write questions. Twice as many students created questions if they were in the game group, but there was a huge impact on answering behavior. More than 40% increase in the median number of answers submitted between the two groups, and that additional answering behavior led to a significant improvement in final exam scores. And the last thing I'll just wrap up in two minutes here is looking at learning. You know, what evidence is there for students that, that students actually perform better on, I mean, learning, what we're talking about by learning is, is mainly exam scores, right? Do they do better at the end of the course? Um, and so there have been nearly 40 studies investigating this, covering a very wide range of subjects. And about a third of these studies do what are effectively partial correlations. So controlling for student ability, do students who engage more perform better? And the answer to that is, is, is yes. Um, and this is one that I really like because here they're looking not just at overall engagement, but do students learn more by authoring questions or by answering questions? And what they, what they did is for every student, they could look at the topics that the students authored their questions on, and then they could partition all of the exam questions into those questions that targeted the same topics as those that were targeted by the authored questions of the student and all of the other questions. So these were called the generation exam questions and the control exam questions. And what they found was a huge increase in performance on those generated topics. Now, there are some threats here. These were student-chosen topics. Um, they did the same thing with, with the answering, or basically, you know, so did students perform better on the questions on the exam that targeted the same topics as those they practice tested with? And they did see a significant improvement, but it was much smaller, about half the size. But the, the, the really interesting thing is that when students generate questions, they cover fewer topics because it takes so much more time. When they're practice testing, they cover many more topics. And in fact, here it was 10 times as many topics. So I think this, some of the things that people are doing around allocating topics to students is exactly the right thing to be doing, making sure that students cover a broad range of topics when they're generating their questions. Um, and my last slide is just, I think, some of the things that are really interesting. I love the fact that there are people here from outside University of Sydney. I think one of the really unexplored areas is looking at having students from different institutions collaborate on a shared repository. To my knowledge, that is being done, so here are some examples, but it has not been evaluated before. I mean, it would be really interesting to know if students find it, you know, uh, if they perceive it to be of greater value to be contributing with students outside of their own institution. Um, and thank you for, for uh, having me here and uh, I took this photo, I tried to do the thing where you try and pinch the thing I clearly, <laughs> I clearly fail but you have a beautiful city uh, you really do uh, and so, so we took this photo the other day thank you very much <laughs> <laughs>